You start to realize, like you said, that they're all the same thing. <laughs> you can lose faith, right? That's what you accused me of um, when I when I left the church. I lost faith. Well, what happens when I lose faith in atheism? What do I become? What am I? Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. So today, I am joined by an incredible guest, a huge powerhouse in the ex-Mormon field. He has been podcasting from 2009 to 2014 and is still continuing to do podcast interviews with John Lynn. I am so honored that he came on to join us, and by the way, if you would rather watch this instead of listen, head over to my YouTube channel, Cults to Consciousness, like, subscribe, all the things. I am joined today by the one and only John Larson. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. So I would love to talk a little bit about your story because I know you were an extremely devout Mormon and now you kind of landed on the atheist side of things. So I want to give our audience the full picture of where you started and where you are now and your views on life, the world, gods, goddesses, and um, <laughs> your perspective on all of that. Well, fantastic. I love all that stuff. So um, again, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk on it. And I, I, you know, I, I think you wanted me to kind of talk about my, my journey. And it, it's, it's interesting because um, the older I get and the more I reprocess it and think about it, it it's, it's like the, the desert. Um, if you go down to the, to the desert, uh, depending on the time of day you're there, where the shadows are, where the sunlight hits, um, it's, it's an entirely different place. I took my kids backpacking out to the back country of the desert a few years ago when they were little. And, you know, we woke up and there was frost on the tent, right? It was, it was below 32 degrees. And then by the, by the late afternoon, it was pushing 80 and we were hiking on hot rocks and all, all that sort of stuff. But just the way everything changes, depending on your current perspective, um, should give us all pause about any of the big conclusions we, we, we make. That's not to say there isn't truth and there isn't, you know, things that are right and things that are wrong. But I'm just ever fascinated every time I reprocess my journey. So I'm I'm laying that out there because here I'm about to do it again, which means I'll probably have a different take on it this time than I have other times. Yeah, that's actually extremely refreshing because I tend to say the same thing to other people and they're like, well, what do you believe? I'm like, well, it's constantly evolving, but I think that's actually the more intelligent perspective because that means you're always open to new information and you're willing to accept new information and move forward. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And these things are all bigger than us. I mean, you take something like um, a cult or a, or a church or, or, or a movement. You know, and even even those things like, you know, Mormonism or the Jehovah Witness uh, movement are subsections of Christianity. And of course, then you have um, Protestantism and then American Protestantism. And, and you have you have these these things that they don't happen in a vacuum. And the context that they happen in is bigger than any of us. There's more people involved. There's more things. And and in a way, it's something that we can never fully comprehend. It's just beyond our ability to do so. And of course, I believe that a lot of things that happen in religion um, um, do so because religion exploits parts of our parts parts of our mind and our evolution, um, especially the group dynamics in our evolution. And that's I said the word exploit, which gives it a negative connotation. That's not necessarily good nor bad. In fact, I think most religions tend to start out as something that's very positive in people's lives. Um, and that that um, taps into our basic needs for community and for socialization and for understanding and being able to process. We're, we're overloaded with so much information all the time. Psychologists have shown this, that one of the things that the mind does is it's constantly filtering out things that it thinks that, that you don't you don't need right right now. Um, and our, our mind's ability to do that is quite amazing. Um, have, have, I think this has happened to most people. Like they come to the end of a day and they're taking off their belt or a pair of shoes or something. And they'll find like a deep kind of cut in their, in their flesh where the, the, the belt or the shoe or something you were wearing that didn't fit had been cutting into you all day. It's welted and it's sore and it stings to the touch. And that's the first you noticed it. 
you know, it's not like the pain um, receptors weren't going off all day long. It's just that your mind kept pushing that down and filtering it out and not presenting it to your conscious self. And I think sometimes that that's true with these religions too. Um, people can frame their experience as positive right up until the day they leave. That happens with marriages all the time. We've all had friends who, you know, they're constantly ballyhooing how great their marriage is, then bam, they're in a messy divorce and with a lot of hate being thrown around. So again, just these things that are happening to us take a lifetime to process and understand. And even then we probably can't fully understand them. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point too, because a lot of people who are involved in cult-like organizations or religions, like you said, they don't realize it until they're away from it. And even then, uh, once you leave the religion, you start to peel back these layers and then you realize there's even more cuts and more cuts and more cuts. And I think that's why ex-Mormons or or ex-religious people tend to get be down on because people are like, you leave the religion, but you can't leave it alone. It's like, no, because I'm I'm just now realizing how damaging it was. And then the more layers you pull back, the more work that you do, the more you realize you've just been deeply programmed. And so, yeah, it does cause hurt and pain. And, and that's why we're trying to basically unwind this programming. Well, I, I love that. You know, that's a that's a phrase that gets thrown around in Mormon circles all the time, um, accusing uh, ex-Mormons of some kind of uh, psychological malfeasance that they can't leave the, the the church alone, and um let's unpack that for a minute, shall we? Yeah. Um, there's there's two possibilities. You walk out of the church uh, or whatever religion you're part of, and you immediately switch on a dime, and your psychology doesn't pay it any attention, and you move on and process things new. Or you carry with you what was put into your mind. Now, for for Mormonism. Um, like a lot of high touch religions, it defined um, not just things like sex, but the minutia of of sex, and and then it would define a, a big barrier around that. You know, like you can't date till you're sixteen. Um, you know, you 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 can't be alone with the opposite sex. Um, you know, if you go to the universities, uh, the churches, universities, you can't have um, any member of the opposite sex in your room. You can't have mm-hmm. them in your apartment after 1030. So it starts giving you all these filters and, and these these filters, these rules, everybody who's in the in the religion internalizes. So food, you know, Mor- Mormonism, of course, has has food laws about they can't drink coffee. And um, but those laws are always in flux. So it's not like you can just go to the code and read it. Because it doesn't mention coffee in there, but Mormons are very against coffee, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. I was 34, 35 um, when I um, really kind of walked away from the church when I finally had enough and I was ready to to, to be free of it. And the time I had two children and a wife, you know, who are all in in, in the church also. Um, So, but the church and its teachings, and this is true of all high contact religion, permeates every aspect of your life. What you eat. Um, how you interact with um, the opposite sex, how you interact with people at work, who is considered your people, who is considered the enemy, um, what clothing you wear. It, it literally seeps into every aspect of identity and how we present ourselves in the world, how we interact with other people. And and those things are deep. They started with in, in indoctrination, these li- songs we were singing when we were two years old and three years old. And the high touch youth programs that are very much about defining what what uh, and what is what is good and what is bad. You know, something like in 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 Mormonism, a common belief was that um, virginity existed and it was something that um, would be soiled if it was um, given away. That teaching is so ever present that it's not like the day you decide I don't believe this religion anymore. All of those teachings just disappear. They're still buried deep in one psyche. And I can't imagine what kind of neuroses or, or psychological problems one would have to have to take one day believing an entire system and philosophy of living, the next day rejecting it, and then no longer processing through any of that. That's not even a possibility. So this is the kind of things that they do to us to try to gaslight us and make us feel like there's something wrong with us. They put up an impossible standard. That the, for that the the ex Mormons or the ex whatever can leave the church, they can't leave it alone. But the church has already been infused into one's own identity and persona and thoughts. 
So there is no leaving alone. You have to slowly, carefully process through all that stuff and decide, oh, this is something I believe or no, that's something I was told. Yeah. And I think one of the worst parts is when the churches end up demonizing the people who leave. So not only are you dealing with this extreme faith crisis, identity crisis, personality crisis, all of the crises, right? Now you are being put down by the church that you used to love and and hold so dearly. And that's the sad part is you leave. And then a lot of times people get just not even excommunicated from the church, but excommunicated from their family members and just completely ostracized. And so you have to rebuild your identity, your personality. You have to build new relationships with people. You have to find new community. And that's extremely difficult. So I'm wondering then, how was it like for you transitioning out of Mormonism? Well, for me, it was a very slow process. Like I I didn't take a drink of alcohol until I had lost my faith in God for two two years. It was years after I would left uh, out, out, of, out of the church. So, um, uh, so my transition was very, very careful. There's others who have epiphanies and I, I'm not, I don't want to um, undermine their experience. They're real. And that, that wasn't mine. They, they, they reach a point and there's some idea that just crystallizes everything in their head. And then one day they believe and one day they, they don't. Um, my, my wife tells the story that she was listening to a, a podcast um, it, it would have had to been mine, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't, I think, I think she's listening to Dylan or something and she talks to, she's out weeding in the garden and listening to this thing. And then she went down to pick up a weed as a believer and pulled up the weed as a non-believer that, that something snapped. Now, wow. uh, she still had to process through all that stuff, right? That was still a, a, a problem for her, but it, but it, but it happened very quickly. This mechanism of deconversion is very mysterious. It is very hard to understand, and and it's hard to manipulate because it's it's so individual. Um, and and you know, for, for me, I think my devoutness. Now, uh, there's two types of devout Mormons. We should we should be clear about. There's a zealotous de- devout, and there's the the social um, cultural identity devout. I was in the second camp. So for, for, for me, all my family lived in, in Utah or thereabouts, and we had been there for many, many generations since the beginning. You know, all my aunts were in Daughters of Utah Pioneer. You know, they had to trace their, mm-hmm. their roots back to people who came across on the prairie schooners. Um, and, and it's just who we were. When I went to BYU, I, I started meeting people who Mormonism was more their, like, performative identity. Like um, it was more important to them, like what music they listened to and that sort of stuff. But where where I grew up in like Weber County, you know, the Mormons listened to everything. Like, you know, you could listen to ACDC or Led Zeppelin or, or, or whatever. And then I met some of these like Utah County Mormons who would only listen to Kenneth Cope or Afterglow or or, or, <laughs> some, or something like that. And, and so I was of the, my DNA is Mormon variety rather than the, I have to perform for the rest of you. Um, and, and so in, in, in some ways that's harder. And you just mentioned, I think it's very important. There's the processing out of the church and maybe selecting a new church or a new community. That's kind of the tip of the iceberg to use a worn out cliche. It's the dealing with the family, with your own identity, dealing with your family, dealing with your friends, dealing with your old social structures. That is the real tough work. And most of that is hidden. Um, it's just not as, as, as present. You were, you said 35 years old when you decided to leave. Yeah, let's see. When I, I the last time I went to church was fall of two thousand five, so I would have been thirty two, I guess. Okay, so then in four years, within that time, you decided to let other people know what you were finding, or how did you end up starting Mormon Expressions? What was it that drove you to do that? No, it's a it's a great question. In the early days, um, you know, in the early two thousands, in the late nineties, um. There were starting to be like Yahoo groups and other places online where people could could meet and swap stories. And these these groups of um, ex-Mormons or questioning Mormons started to surfacing. And then there got to be these discussion boards, um, um, R- RFM, uh, which was reform from Mormonism or something like that, was a giant one. Um, the foyer was a was a big one. Um, and again, just like local Yahoo groups. So I had gone online to start 
you know, talking to people, finding others, um, discussing this stuff out almost as an, as an attempt to save one's testimony. Um, so there, there were those online groups, uh, um, not long after, um, we left the church, uh, which was 2005 or, or stopped attending, I should say about 2006, I started getting involved in local communities, um, support groups, um, that, that, um, helped people who were leaving the church because really everybody online at the time would use fake names. And you used to go to parties like um, ex-Mormon parties, like in the 2000s, and people would have their moniker and then their real name below it. So you knew, oh, you're Helaman's Ghost 69, you know, it, then, <laughs> then, then you knew who you were talking to. And some of these people had developed these really big personas. I've, I've said before, one of the things that I think made myself successful and John DeLynn successful is we both independently decided to use our real names. Which um gave which meant we were a real person. We were no longer just a shadow entity out on on the internet. Now, of course, late two thousands, Facebook comes along and changes everything, so people can't um can't function in private. But I'd started working with the communities and been heavily involved in that. I for in Davis County, Utah, I headed the group of of um, post Mormons. Um, we called it post Mormon was a great big site that a lot of people met on. Um, and had regional um, places everywhere around. Again, Facebook kind of destroyed it. Um, and and then I moved um, with work. I moved out of state. I moved to North Carolina. So I was cut off from people who I like to discuss these issues with. So I decided to, I decided to start the podcast more as an academic exercise to find other people who found Mormonism interesting and wanted to talk about it, but evolved from there. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's interesting. I guess I would have thought that it was the doctrine that you wanted to let everyone know was a fraud <laughs> to like put that out there. But I love that it started from a place of community and curiosity and just wanting to know more. That's really great. No, I, I, I never I, I've said it over and over again. People don't believe me. I never really had the intention of leading people out of the church because actually losing one's testimony is hard psychologically and it's culturally violent. Um, by that, I mean that the, the, the Mormon culture is set up such that non-belief is seen as an aggressive action. Uh, let me give you a, a case in point. If, if you have a sibling who's going to get married and they get married in the temple, to attend that, you have to be a member in good standing and you have to have a bishop sign off on your um, temple recommend, right? And to do so, you have to pay the church 10% of your gross income. So, so there's these, but, but to not attend a temple um, wedding is seen as a major cultural breach, just, just like it would be seen as a cultural breach, to not attend your sibling's wedding outside the, the church. So you're, you're caught in this double bind, um, all the time where being true to your own feelings and not going to the temple recommend and either lying or changing your life to answer the questions the, the way they want means that you're going to be shaming or humiliating your sister. Um, so, and this just goes on and on and on and on. So the whole um, cult, the reason we call it the cult is organized to ostracize the outsider. Now, now um, people who reject core values are always seen in, in, in my esteem, anthropologically as the worst of the worst. The worst thing you can be is a traitor. And so Mormons and others um, process the world um, in this three-pronged view of everything. There's Mormons, there's the rest of the world, potential Mormons, and then there's the traitors, the, 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 the ex-Mormons. So you're still living and, um, with, these, with people who are your family and you should have a loving, familial relationship with, and suddenly you've become to them the worst thing you could possibly be. And that just puts a lot of strain on um, relationships. Enormous. Yeah. What was that like for you? Did you experience that same thing with your family? Yeah, my family is still um, is still divided. Um, I there's four children uh, that my parents had. Um, I talked to my sister. I'm estranged from my two brothers, um, and there have been incidents that 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 have that have come up. Um, um, some of them see my um, and that, that extends to the extended family too. Um, so some of them see my 
action, my my public action um, against the church as a personal affront. Mm. So it's damaged relationships beyond repair. Oh, that's so difficult because everything that you have to say, I mean, I listen to your episodes and, and the ones with John DeLynn and they're so intellectual. They're so to the point. You lay out all of the information, all of the data, and it's impossible not to see the flaws within it. And that's another reason I wanted to bring you on is for your opinions and your perspectives on the pragmatic and the logical side of things. So I would love to transition into your belief system, what atheism means to you and how it changes your view of the world. Yeah, I I always had an affinity for the New Testament in particular. I, I like Jesus. I like what he has to say. Um he's there's not a lot there um and we have the historical problems of a 2000 year old document one that was written hundreds of years uh potentially or at least 100 years after he was gone um you can imagine if you and i were trying to write the biography of mark twain right now um it probably wouldn't be uh, th- just through verbal culture just through everything we've heard about him it probably wouldn't be that accurate right um but we could we could maybe catch the gist of what he was saying and, and understand who he was a little bit um, so you have, you have that problem, but, but I, I really did like that. And as, as my faith in the Mormon church was crumbling, um, mostly from historical and doctrinal issues, um, uh, polygamy became the thing that, that kind of set me off. Um, I had, I'd had struggles before, but I really wanted to get to the bottom of it. And I really said, well, I'm just going to read source material. So it was an intellectual pursuit of trying to really understand polygamy that, that had the whole thing collapse for me. Right. Um, but, but, um, to, to me, it, it, it was, it was an academic pursuit. And the reason I, I, I bring that up is once Mormonism crumbled, I, I, I thought, well, I'll find solace in Christianity. I figured I'd end up as some kind of liberal Christian. And I got two books. I, I recently saw them. I got a syst- systemic, um, theology of, of Christianity. And then I got a history of the Christian church, um, both written, not antagonistically does that make sense they were both academic um works but they were written by um by by believers by the time i got done with both those books my faith in christianity was gone and then i, I started reading you know other materials like um, bart ehrman and, and stuff like that and the you know the the i i naturally had an affinity for philosophy and that sort of stuff so i i could start seeing some of the 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 the, the flaws but that didn't diminish my affinity for 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 the the greater christian world um uh, but it it just it it didn't resonate with me on the basis of saying this is the truth big t this is something that that um i should believe or have faith in and in fact probably the biggest casualty was the idea of faith at all like when you really peel it back and say why do we keep talking about faith as a virtue because faith basically means to accept and believe something that most everybody around you believes without proper evidence um, of it being there. And we speak of it as a big virtue because it gets people to act in concert, which is really important to fight wars and do things like that. But to me, it's it's not it's not a virtue. I don't know why I need to have faith in anything. Right. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting when you start to get down to the basics of cult mentality, you realize that they heavily rely on faith because they get you to discard your logical mind, to put aside the things that are sending up red flags for you and say, no, 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 just have faith. I know it doesn't make sense. Just have faith. We'll, we'll figure it out when we die. And no, 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 that's not how it should work. We should be able to use our logical mind and we should be able to all con- come to the same conclusion that something is true if it actually is true. So I love that you bring that up because <clears throat> faith is such, like you said, an interesting concept. And I think uh, for me, I would rather replace faith with hope because that's not relying on any sort of circumstances to be true or false. It's just, yeah, I hope that I have a great life. I hope there's a heaven. That would be awesome. But to have faith in that, it it connotates, like you said, that I just can't prove it, so I'll just believe it anyway. Yeah, I, I think I think that resonates with me also. I, I think one of the troubles is processing through this stuff and trying to understand it is takes a lot of mental energy and time and free time to be able to read, you know, a lot of thick books and talk to a lot of people who are using big words and it can get yeah. exhausting. 
Um, and I think that's one of the reasons religions exist. This world is such a complicated, convoluted, messed up, scary place that is way beyond any of our comprehension. You know, we just simply don't know what's going on 99% of the time. We don't like to admit that, but you know, there's 8 billion people on this planet. We don't, we don't have any idea what most people are doing. Now, rather than sound conspiratorial, because you can figure it out, it just takes work. Um, and most of us don't have the time. We're, we're struggling just to make ends meet and, you know, and get your kids packed off to school with a school lunch and, and whatever. And, and, it, and if you, unless you have an inclination to this sort of stuff, unless you think it's fun, it, it's easier to accept a framework, especially when you find that there's community and there's genuine love and affection that happens in these communities. Cults are fun. <laughs> They're a lot of fun. They 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 rep replicate. I think our early evolutionary small communities. Um, they give us a way to be interdependent on each other. They give us a, a way to interact and have um, um, emotional intimacy with other people without it being sexualized, which is really hard to do. They give us a way to be intergenerational. I mean, we could sit here all day and list the benefits. And that's where a lot of people argue with me because they see that. That, but I have to say ultimately, well, truth matters, and and a lot of this is ignoring all the floatsome and jetsome from the religion, all the people that the religion rolls over, and smashes and and um, destroys in order to preserve the fake narrative. But that fake narrative is the way it is because it helps narrow down the world and helps it seem doable. You bring up a really good point, though, because all of these good things seem to blind the people, like you said, and it is a privilege to just have the opportunity to look into the truth. But having all of those good things still, community, friends, and something to believe in, do you think that still outweighs the mind control and the physical control and everything that these cults perpetuate? I, I, th I think there's another kind of darker angle here which is um, for, for years, you know, we had an American cultural tradition of trick-or-treating. Kids would go, it was one of the ways that we engaged the entire neighborhood, right? The kids would get their costumes, they'd go from house to house to house to house. And then um, part of one of the conservatives' panics, they are always having panics, um, that, that they started doing these things called trunk-or-treats. So, you know, when I was in Utah, what happened is all of a sudden, um, this is like early 2000s, the Mormons would all take their kids out of this milieu and then they'd drive over to the church and then they would do it there. I remember. Now, <laughs> now most Mormons are not bad people, so they might send out invites to the rest of the community, but the rest of the community is like, what are you talking about? And who gave you the authority to shut down a cultural um, element that we all shared? Why do you have supremacy over that? Which, which of course, made people not, not go. So the kids who um, were the Mormon kids would go and then get big hauls of candy in short time because they just go from car to car to car to car to car. And oftentimes there would be a big bowl of chili cooking and cider. And, and so it was it was a one up event. Everybody on the neighborhoods was like, what what the hell happened? Why are all the houses dark? Why is nobody answering their door when we go trick or treating? So oftentimes religions cut their piece of pie right out of the middle and they will externalize these costs i mean literally like you you go through a, a high religious place and you see all these churches well they're not paying property tax so that means that to to pay for the but there's a road in front of them and they're connected to the sewer and they're connected to the water so all the infrastructure costs that those churches have are externalized onto everybody else so that means everybody who's not a mormon that cost goes up. Now, if you're a Mormon, you go to the church, and you get this great building and this thing kind of for free, or you get it subsidized by all the people who are not Mormons. So, so I think we have to remember that they, they oftentimes do um, a lot of good in the community by taking away from the community in general um, because they have control over it. The church in, in Utah has great big welfare programs where they have these granaries, the ones you pass by on the freeway, they're all owned by the church. And they have these storehouses where you can go. It's like a full-on shopping center, and you can get everything you want. At the whim of your bishop, he gets to decide what you get and what you don't get. So what they do is they take our general social services that we have as a community that make us 
great. They make America a great place to be. And then they opt out of them and then they start to take the ones apart because that means the cost of not being a member is higher. So you have to kowtow to them all the time. So I, I think we, we have to be careful. The church are, members are human beings, just like the rest of us, and they recognize what is good, just like the rest of us. But they also like to um, tip the scales to give themselves advantage. And that's one of the reasons people outside the church seem more angry than they should, because people inside the church are like, what are you talking about? This is great. S Sister Sally lost her job, and we and and we were able to find her a new job and get her all this kind of stuff, blah, 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 blah. But they don't talk about Nora down the street who had an affair 10 years ago and was kicked out of the church. So now it's like, let her burn, let her rot. We're not going to do anything for her. Let's externalize those costs. Yes, exactly. It's, it's the us versus them mentality. Mm -hmm. I'll give you, I'll give you another example. I, I saw an uh, apologist one time. I'm um, talking about how there, there was um, a lower rate of um, infidelity in the church or something. But the, 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 the question is, well, what if you get caught in the church being um, unfaithful? And the answer is you get excommunicated. You get thrown out of the church. So it's not a bragging right to say we have a lower rate if you just eliminate people who do that because, <laughs> because you're manipulating the statistics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I never, never considered that. This is why I love our conversations or our converse, the conversations that I've witnessed from you because everything is so logical and... It's like, yeah, of course, that makes sense. So as far as your belief in God, then transitioning over to that, could you give your fabulous definition of atheism for those who don't know? Well, there's a lot of different atheists and 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 um, and then there's a lot of different agnostics. Right. And I, I, I think the the. The, the, there's there's several things I've said, so I don't I don't know which one you're after, but I think I think I do. Um, I define myself as a null case atheist, N U L L, meaning I lost my faith in God. Um, but there was nothing there at the bottom when 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 I when I when I got there. I have heard apologists argue, and I've had it said to me that that being an atheist is just another form of faith. Right? You have to have faith to believe there's not a God there. And then my response is twofold. Well, um, you can lose faith, right? That's what you accused me of um, when I when I left the church. I lost faith. Well, what happens when I lose faith in atheism? What what do I become? What am I? And whatever the answer to that question is, that's what I am. <laughs> so, and it's 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 nothing. There's there's just there's just nothing there. Um, um, so so I I don't have i i i've i've encountered a lot of definitions of god um religion interests me a lot and um i've studied everything from witchcraft to zen buddhism um and i haven't found any anything that's compelling enough to make me want to believe um or that makes my mind say that's the right answer i haven't found any problems on this planet that aren't better explained by atheism than by theism. And I find I haven't found a theistic explanation that doesn't have more problems on the backside that it requires people to say, I have faith in order to, to, to understand. Now, part of that is I think atheism is a sect or a denomination of Christianity, um, at least the way we talk about it in the United States, because it's defined in terms of Christianity all the time. So it's really the wrong question because whenever any whenever I really want to argue with somebody, um, or I don't want to argue with them, I should say, say I will argue with you about God as soon as you define it. Give me a term, give me a definition, and and nobody has one. So we're talking about theism all the time and atheism without even un defining that main term. So how can I be an a something? If, if there's no something there, if there's nothing that, that we've been told is. So I, I, I don't see any choice that I've ever made in the matter. I just don't believe in any framework of God that I've ever been presented with. Right. So if someone were to say to you, okay, my definition of God is that he's an all-powerful, all-knowing being. Yeah, well, I then let's let's take those thing, things apart. Like, what what does it mean to be all knowing? I don't know how how do, how do we not get too 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 nutty down here? <laughs> like like the world is a really complicated place. There's a lot of things that happen. 
Um, and those things happen without planning, right? I, I, uh, we have a little farm here, and one of the things we just started um, growing are mealworms. So we started a little mealworm farm. And these little buggers are fascinating to watch, you know, as they all move around and they, they eat and they, they, they search for things. You can sit and stare at them for hours. Um, so God is in the head of every one of those mealworms as they decide, you know, where they're going to look for food, what they're going to do when they encounter an obstacle. Like, like their brains are tiny, but they're not insignificant when you compare them to the rest of the universe. If we were out there on a, on a, mission to to jupiter and we found something like a mealworm we would be blown off our socks the complexity of that organism is huge there's there's thousands of mealworms in my in my farm there's 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 trillions of them and god knows all of them well what is this being that the entirety of the universe how big and vast it is exists as a subset of this being's mind so when you say all knowing that it doesn't make any sense to me, I'm not, I'm not trying to poke holes into it. I'm trying to say, please help me understand what it means to know everything. I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah. I think there was something that you had mentioned in one of your YouTube videos about if he's all knowing and all powerful, that means that something more all knowing and all powerful would have had to create him. And then you just have to wind it back and wind it back. And where does it end? Yeah, well, the the let's unpack that a little bit. In my mind, there's really two possibilities. So, so, so Christians oftentimes, and I'll, I'll caveat this with Christians. That's who I encounter the most. To be honest with you, I've met a lot of Hindus in my life, but I haven't really had a lot of theistic debates with them. Okay, so, so you know, Christians oftentimes argue the God from complexity. This is one of the standard five arguments that still sticks around that it's used, saying this. This universe that we live in, the the being human being is too complicated to explain by chance, they would say. So we have to posit a more complex being in order to solve for that complexity. So we have to say, well, this couldn't have just happened. So there is a God. But to me, then now you've got a new system. So you have the universe here and then you have God here. Well, once you draw a circle around those two things, you have a new system. And then we ask the same question to that one. Well, now you've got a system that was more complicated than the first one because it has a being that's more complicated than the first entity, which is the universe. So do you then posit that there is another being that is more complicated than that? And then you have to keep keep going because there's no logical gap stop. Now, they usually just say, well, by definition, God is the gap stop. God is the first cause. But But they're just saying that. So that's possibility number one. Possibility number two is that universe came into being by a god or whatever, but it's slightly less complicated. It really doesn't know what every single millworm in the universe is doing, but it's still, for all intents and purposes, all powerful and all knowing. So that being would be less complex than the universe. So you could say, well, where did that being come from? Well, something even less complex than that. And and the problem is if you follow the, that down, that's the theory of evolution, right? Mm -hmm. Is that. <laughs> is that less complicated things can come together to form more complex things. So the only other out is steady state, which is really hard to argue that just always been this way and always will be. But both of the, both of the ways they say through greater complexity or steady state has a problem of, of saying, well, this world is a really terrible place for a lot of people, maybe not for you, but for a lot of people. It's, there's, there's millions of people starving to death right now. There's millions of people who are, who are, or are probably sub millions who are being tortured in ways that you can't comprehend right now. And so if you have a good life, it's easy to say, you know, this God loves me. I'm so blessed. But uh, if you're going to posit a God, you have to explain why God wants it this way. Of course, then they introduce evil, which we can talk about the problem of evil in a minute if you want. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it now. The theodicy. Why is there evil in this world? Um, well, first of all, um, you have to define evil, which is harder than it seems. Um, because if if I, you know, if if I said, um, I don't know, the Iranian government today launched a missile aimed at taking out an Iranian trader in Chicago, but it fell on a neighborhood school and killed 30 children. 
we would define that as evil. That exact same thing the U.S. has done multiple times. But we don't define that as evil because it's us, right? We're the good guys, so what we do is good. So I, uh, to, in order for have a discussion about evil, you have to give me an abstracted definition of evil that's not the, the foes, not our, our competitors. And, and that's equally hard to, to define. Um, I, you know, I told you I have a small farm and you, you watch animals interact with each other and, you know, like chickens, uh, I love chickens. Chickens are fun, but man, those roosters sure rape those hens a lot. They seriously, (laughs) my mom has chickens, same thing. And, and, and they will tear each other to pieces. Yeah. The rooster also breaks up fights between the hens. They will literally peck each other to death. Um, ducks are really super rapey. Um, there's all sorts of problems that we define evil that are ever present through the animal kingdom. Um, and then you can see them uh, surface in human beings too. And better an explanation might be, well, why did God put rape in the animal kingdom? Then why did this guy rape this woman? Even though it's an equ- it's a terrible thing. I'm not justifying it in any way. I'm just saying, I don't think we need to posit a devil to explain away the things that we see as being evil. Yeah, that's a great point. And there's something that I heard, I don't know if it was a pastor or someone said, well, without adversity, we would never have any lessons to learn. So what would you say to that? Says who? <laughs> like, I mean, they, they, they say stuff like that all the time. They just say these things and they sound good. And we all say, mm, that's really deep. You know, well, what do you mean without diverse? It, 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 they're, they're all hypothetical questions. We are animals that evolved on this planet. It is obvious. It is clear, you know, and, and we had the foibles and follies of our evolutionary past temperature swings and whatever that caused us to, to evolve the way we do. And we are what we are. I think one of the problems that humanity struggles with is we don't want to accept our humanity. I, I heard it pointed out years ago that the, the words that are taboo or things that are taboo to say almost always point back to the fact that we're animals. Um, they deal with scatological issues, excretory issues, reproductive issues, decay, death, right? Anything that reminds us that we are just as subjected to this material world as everything else, we don't, we don't even want to think about. We want to hide. We, we, you know, um, we want to cover, cover it up. So, so we get into this, this state where we spend a lot of time fooling ourselves into believing we're not living on the world we actually are. And then we say things like without adversary, adversarial, whatever, we wouldn't grow. But do we grow? Is there advice, you know, like what, what are, what are people even talking about? Yeah. And I love that we're bringing it back to just being animals. Like we are just evolved from animals. And having said that, knowing that we are a part of this ecosystem, a part of this earth connected in some way, shape or form, do you think that you might lean more towards like a paganistic view or like, because I know that you love and respect and want to save this planet. So does that lean into your beliefs at all or not so much? Oh uh, yeah, it does. I think that at the root of every religion, the the core of every religion is, is, is good. It, 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 it points to the elements that, that, that make us better and what makes us better is being interconnected. We can't survive on our own. If you lock somebody up away from others so they can't talk to others, for 99 out of 100 people will go insane pretty quick, like within weeks. Um, we exist socially. We're social creatures. We want to um, love and care for our, our fellow people beings and we want to be loved and cared for. And to me, that's a clear evolutionary ad- adaptation because it's really hard to survive. We don't have claws. We don't have fur. We don't have teeth. We're, we're, a, we're a social animal that needs each other to survive. So those things manifest very positive for us. And religions usually um, figure out a way to um, enhance that in, 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 at their core, to bring us together, to make us um, love one another, to make us take care of each other to make us pool our resources, to move away from our selfishness, our, our, our out of control lust, our greed, and those sort of things that the, the plague us. But the problem is once those things get calcified, 
once they get written down into laws, you know, the first thing a religion does is say, listen, don't kill people. Thou shalt not kill. That's always like kind of the first thing. And then you read on in the books and then they always start making exceptions, except we can kill people. You know, we say thou shalt not kill, but we say kid in 1968 who just got drafted, go to Vietnam and, 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 and kill the VC. Right. And then we'll create all sorts of justification around it. Well, to me, that's metaphoric for the problem that happens in religion. But the bigger problem is there are malevolent human beings. We talk about the holy or the unholy trifecta. You know, there are sociopaths among us. There are narcissists among us. There are those who are super greedy. There are those who have no empathy. The problem is once we put these structures in place, those guys manipulate the systems and rise to the top. You know, when people look at like the the negative characteristics of of like um, Donald Trump or whoever you want to pick, John F. Kennedy, and they say why are, why are these guys you know why it's always that way because the least scrupulous among us will rise to the top, and those who want to cheat and lie and manipulate will also rise to the top. They're the ones who gain gain the most resources. Um, so. Religion exists because we have a dual nature. We're both greedy and selfish, and we we like to name people as enemies. And once we name them as enemies, we're violent. We will kill them. We will hurt them. We will harm them. We will steal from them. And then we have this nature of we have our own little in-group that we will love and protect and do right things for. So, so religion allows other people, once it becomes calcified, to manipulate those things. You know, um, the Mormon church famously got caught with their pants down two years ago with $100 billion in an account. Well, it's because the guys who are running the church know how to steal money from widows and from poor people. They don't know how to spend it because spending it would be to do what the, the part of the religion that they don't care about. So the real challenge with religion is it tends to be a fertile ground for the, 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 the rascals. If you, if you plow a field, you have fresh dirt and fresh soil. If you do nothing, you're just going to get toxic, noxious, noxious weeds that were worse than what you had before. You have to keep caring for it. And religions have struggle with that. You bring up an interesting point. The, one of the first things that came to mind as you were talking about how religion actually breeds the people that hurt other people. I'm like, that's like where the evil comes from. Hold on. <laughs> So if we're talking about good versus evil, from your description just now, it, it feels like religion is what actually creates the evil that it's supposed to be battling and it's supposed to save you from. Uh, yeah, the only thing I would modify is uh, it, it doesn't really create it. it. It creates an environment where it flourishes. Mm. You know, you know, like you, you can clean out your fridge and then come back and have mold in there um, because something you did gave environment the, the mold. Um, can flourish in. And I think that's a key distinction because otherwise it makes people like me sound like we're condemning all all religion is once you have a religious view, because you started by asking me about paganism and that's, I went off on a long rant on that. <laughs> that's okay. The elements underlying um, neo-paganism really is a, trying to answer and return to the ways our ancestors solve these problems. And I, I've done some deep reading because I think one of the problems with a secular worldview is lack of ceremony, lack of consistency. And I think generally in our society, we have lost track of the earth. We've lost track of time cycles. Like um, most people don't understand if you asked them, okay, um, how long can you harvest lettuce? How, how many weeks do you have? Most people would say, well, you can harvest lettuce anytime because it's always there in the store. But that's because we've pieced together all these different systems where we're pulling lettuce from different parts of the world at different times. In reality, wherever you live, there's a short window of time where you can have lettuce, right? And we've we've lost track of that completely. Um, and and our the the myths and gods and ceremonies of our ancestors almost always tied into some um, reality. Like in, in England, prior to like, let's say the 1700s, there were really four big holidays, four big important days. And that was um, 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 in bulk on February 2nd. It was um, 
uh, Wal- St. Walpurgis Day on May 1st. Um, it was Lofmas or, or, or Lamas on Feb- on on uh, November or on August 1st. And then the fourth one um, was um, Halloween. Um, that 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 time frame. And 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 these these four dates line up with each other. They're, they're these four, but they were markers. Loaf mass in on August first marked the day really that you started harvesting the wheat. And so, if you think about it from um, a traditional perspective, you really wanted to use up all the wheat that you had before by either giving it to the animals or throwing it out by August first. So the fact that they would have a big festival of bread and eat lots of bread makes perfect sense it was also they lived according to the calendar so it marked the day that they knew they needed to harvest they knew they needed to plant at this time they knew that right after they had this holiday that that the the certain fish were running up the river and it was the best time of the year to fish for them so so and and then they 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 encoded cultural values that that they taught from generation to generation to generation because it was pre-industrial there was no real way to manipulate them There is no real way to appoint yourself high druid because people who are 300 miles away wouldn't, wouldn't care. You know, like um, you couldn't exercise the kind of power you needed armies and roads and things like that to do. So so I think the core of religion always speaks to a kernel of truth and goodness for human beings, a utility, and then it gets manipulated and changed. So, so oftentimes the, the pagans or, or, or we can talk about witchcraft a little bit in a minute. Um, they're, they're, they're trying to reclaim that hidden truth and that meaning that our ancestors had. Right. Just like Saturnalia being <laughs> commandeered for Christmas. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, for, for polytheistic religions, the gods embodied something. So, um, you know, like, like, a uh, harvest or, or whatever, or rain or, or something like that. And in a lot of ways, it makes as much sense. We'll just say it makes equally as much sense as having a single God. Um, because if you have um, um, a God that can be angry, that might cause it to dry up. But but at the same time, then you have a bumper sheep harvest. It's kind of hard to explain that nature of God, where God is acting in two ways that are contradictory. But if there is a God of the flocks and a God of the field, then you can a- ask yourself, why is the God of the field angry at us and the God of the flocks is rewarding us, which might train people to hedge their bets, right? To not, they didn't engage in monoculture or, in, or just growing one plant because um, it was embedded in the system that you didn't do it. I think that seems to make the most sense. And I recently learned that back in, Bible times, people actually knew or were aware of other gods, but they chose to believe in the Christian God. So even back then, people were like, yeah, that seems feasible that there would be more than one, but we're going to choose to worship this one specifically. Well, yeah. And if, if, if you go and conquer a people who believe in Beelzebub or, you know, because all, all the all the words for devils in the Bible come from other people's gods, right? The, the, the practical, pragmatic thing to do is to leave them their gods, leave them their temples, allow them to worship their god. Now, you're going to demand that they worship the emperor because they have to to fall in line with the structure. But generally speaking, you let the people have their gods. Because if you don't, you get the problem we have in Palestine today. You have two irreconcilable religious forces that there is no compromise for. The only solution without allowing two cultures to coexist in Palestine is genocide. There's nothing else. So, so by, but in, in this day and age where we're so caught up in truth and asking, is our God superior to the other ones? We push ourselves into situations that are bloodier than they had to be in the past because, you know, the Greeks just let you keep whatever God you wanted. You just had to pay tribute to, to, you know, Alexander. Right. And it's mind blowing that wars have been waged and hundreds and thousands of people have been murdered through genocide or whatever, worshiping a God that we can't even prove is real. (laughs) So it's like, we're all believing in certain fairy tales, if you will. And if you don't believe in mine, then I'm going to kill you for it. But I can't even prove that my fairy tale is the right one. Well, at, it shows what's wrong with us in that we can't see that. 
at least most of us can't, that every single army that has ever marched off to war does so with the name of God on their lips, that, that it takes that level of devotion to willingly sacrifice yourself. And why we cannot get it through our thick skulls that everybody's doing exact same thing. Therefore, our thing is not that special. I can't understand. I sometimes feel alienated from humanity, to be honest with you, because I see things that I think are so obvious, like that everybody's playing the same game that seem to escape 99% of everybody else. And I, I can't quite figure out why. Yeah, I think <laughs> there's there's so much to unpack, but... I think one of the main things for me was like, oh, how much of a coincidence is it that I was born into the one true church of the planet, right? Or like, oh, you just so happen to be born into the right church, insert any religion here. And when you start to realize, oh, I think that we've just been conditioned to believe that ours is the right way. And then we realize that everyone in every religion has been conditioned to believe that theirs is the right way. You mm -hmm. start to realize, like you said, that they're all the same thing. <laughs> Yep. Well, no, I, I think there's a natural sorting that goes on there. I think all religions kind of have this, hey, we're super special. But I think like the majority of people, if, if you went anywhere into, I don't know, um, Mumbai, I don't know, Kabul, uh, Bangkok, Singapore, and you, you would find that there's a local, like, traditional belief, the dominant religion. And I think you'd find a, a great majority of people are pretty lackluster about it. They don't have a lot of opinion one way or the other. Um, you know, it might influence them for good, or they might get some kind of national identity out of it, but they really don't care very much. So uh, I don't care what Catholic dio diocese you're in or, or Mormon stake. The majority of people they have on their books are not there. So who's there when you tell the message saying you're super special, you're different and you're better than everyone else. There's a, a big segment of the population is like, eh, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to go drink a beer with my friends. And then there's a segment of the population that says, yes, I'm better than everybody else. And what's unfortunate is those are the people who are the most devout in religions. They're the people who that message of them being super special, that, that their thoughts are not their thoughts. God's whispering in their ear. They're the chosen. They're the delight ones, delightful ones. They're the ones who have God's secret ear. That appeals to them. And then they unfortunately act in ways that try to make it true. They will oppress and suppress and marginalize people who aren't. And then it gets this big feedback loop. That's why religion tends to be a cancer. Yeah, I agree with that. And I love that you've also looked into so many different types of religions, so you've really done your research. And having seen all of the pieces that each religion offers that may offer some good into the world, have you taken away any of those specifically? Is there anything from any sort of religion that you've kind of stuck with? Or how does your day-to-day -day life look now that you've kind of seen through all of it and essentially just done your research? Um, Buddhism is pretty well as close to the truth as you can get. Um, the, the, especially, um, when you look at the, the, the core, you, you'll, you'll get a core teaching from, um, 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 a master or whatever, and then you'll get more and more and more and more stuff put on that. And if you strip down to the core of Buddhism and, and what, what was really taught by the Buddha, I think those things have been demonstrated time and time and time and time again. I don't know of any religion that has stood the test of science. If I, if I look at like core Buddhist teachings, um, I, I can't think of a single scientific discovery that would go against um, what was being taught by the Buddha. So I, if anybody is really interested in, in like getting to the core of truth, then I would suggest Buddhism. That being said, if you're just looking at ways to live a better life, they almost all have, have, um, have value, right? Um, so, so I, I think the, the idea of Buddhism, that this, that there is suffering in the world, um, you know, that's the first noble truth. And, and what we want to do is just reduce suffering. You, you want to, you know, basically what the Buddha taught is whatever causes suffering, stop it and, and, and pursue paths that reduce harm and suffering. I mean, to me that that's just an, a self obvious truth that we should all say, yes, so let's live our lives to reduce the suffering of, of others. 
Now, how does that juxtapose to like Mormonism? Mormonism believes and Catholicism is a similar route that if you do something, let's say you're a teenager and you get a Hummer in the back seat. Well, they're going to make you suffer. They want you to be humiliated. They want you to suffer, um, which is kind of ironic because the teaching also is that Jesus Christ did the suffering so that we don't have to. But they still they still lean into those negative aspects of life and, and, and want those things. So I think of the core truth, and this is, of course, way more because I'm just I'm just brushing by. But there's a great book by, I think, Robert Wright out there, How We Know Buddhism is True. He wrote it like three or four years ago. Anybody who's curious, I would suggest to read that. He makes the best case for it. But Buddhism is not a religion in the same manner that, that these other things we're talking about are. And I know I'm just throwing out these big bombs and moving on. But I just I want to make this statement um, with like witchcraft and paganism. There's kind of an idea of intention and intent and and modeling those things. So when when a practicing witch um, and I don't believe that there's any like magic behind any of that. But when there's a practicing witch who has her altar and these things mean things to her and as she as she ranges those and basically does a prayer and meditation on them, those things can give value in the same way therapy can. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example. I have, I have um, two um, children who are on the autism spectrum and, um, and they're, they're both doing great. They're both um, young adults. Um, one of them, um, when he was going to therapy, when he was a teenager, oftentimes he, he couldn't come up with anything to say. And the therapist basically had these things which were ostensibly tarot cards. Um, they weren't tarot. They weren't a tarot deck at all. And then they would they would lay the cards down to in order to inspire my child to be able to think and framework things out. That's what these things do. The people practice when people practice witchcraft or or, or paganism. They're 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 finding methods that we've of course we keep rediscovering these things over and over again, like talk therapy. Of course, like our ancestors knew to talk to one another. Um, they were just probably not as isolated and as lonely as we are. So they didn't have to pay people to do that. They found other people to do it. So oftentimes the the, the core practices of religion can be very valuable. And I find value in those things. That's amazing. So it sounds like you're doing great. A farm up in, um, what part of Oregon are you in? I'm I'm in the I'm in the Willamette Valley. So I'm, I'm oh. a couple hours south of Portland. Okay. Yeah, it seems like you're extremely happy and you've landed at a place that lights you up and makes you excited. And every now and then you you um, get into the down and dirty details of religion with <laughs> with John DeLynn. Is anybody extremely happy? I don't I don't think happiness works that way. I <laughs> Please, tell me tell me your version. Happiness is a temporary state. It's it's like lust. You know, you can feel it sometimes and it's great. Um in the right circumstance, but to want to always be in that state is, is silly and it would, it would quickly lose meaning. That's why like both heaven and hell as captured by Christians, both are meaningless entities, eternal, eternal pain and eternal joy would just become meaningless after, after tens of thousands of years, it would have not, it would be nothing. Um, so, so happiness is, is is a state that's that's achieved but you know one, one of the things i and this speaks to what my religion is i find i cannot manufacture my own happiness i can do something that i like doing over here and sometimes it makes me happy and sometimes it doesn't but i can influence the happiness of others around me more than i can influence my happiness so if i just give up on trying to make myself happy and instead i work on making others around me happy or making us collectively happy then i'm happier but we're not designed to be happy all the time. We're not designed to be in joy all the time. Your body was specifically evolved to feel pain and anxiety and anguish because those are useful things. Those are important things. And we don't like them, but they're necessary. Yeah, that actually, that brings up a good point where religion tends to monopolize feelings. If you're feeling happy, it's because you're righteous. And if you're feeling bad, it's because of Satan. So I like the idea that you're just like, no, happy and sad and angry and all of the emotions are just part of the experience. And I'm going to experience all of them at some point, And it is what it is. Yeah, I, I think I heard Richard Dawkins, I think is who it was, gave the example of a deer. You know, their their life is full of anxiety and fear and running away and they're probably going to get eaten anyway. 
right? That's probably their 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 fate. They're not going to die in a retirement home. Um, that's sort of a miserable way to live, but that's their evolutionary hand. That's that's how they evolved. They're prey, so they're skittish. They run away. Um, and and we would be better to acknowledge the full truth of who we 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 are and why we're feeling anxious. I think one of the reasons we're feeling anxious and stressed is everything has been manipulated and all the joy of being uh, alive has been co-opted and um, turned into a money-making opportunity. Uh, What if you want to meet a a, a potential mate? You're going to get on Tinder or Bumble or something. Um, If you want to talk to your mom, you probably get on Facebook. You know, if you want to be around other people, you'll go down to a restaurant. Like what we've done is we've isolated and separated everybody. And then we've monetized every possible human interaction we can and then controlled them in a way that makes the most money for the companies. And and so we've taken what it means to be human and our consumer culture has stripped it all away. And then we're all like anxious and in distress and we're asking ourselves why. Well, you know, part of me moving out here was to is to eschew much of what we do in our society. I don't think it's evil. I don't think people are wrong for doing it, but I think it causes us stress. We're not living the way we evolved to live. So, you know, my religion is to get more in touch with with the ways we did things in the past. So what are some specifics that you're doing to combat the commercialization or the isolation that society has given us? Well, you have to get with other people. <clears throat> you have to tolerate them. Other people smell bad and they're jerks and they say things that hurt our feelings and they don't know when to leave and they eat all of our good stuff and la, 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 la. Like being around other people is a pain. And also it's, it's, it's hard to share things. If I have my own washing machine, I can wash my clothes whenever I want. If I'm by myself, I can watch whatever I want on the TV. I don't have to compromise with anybody. I get to eat exactly what I want. I don't have to eat anything I don't like. And that childish strain in us has been so exploited that you have to get beyond it. You have to put down, you have, you know, I I left Facebook in 2014 and it negatively impacted my social world. It absolutely did. But the payoff is, is more. You have to get out there and put yourself out there and meet people and invite them into your space. You have to, stop buying some things. You have to stop participating in some things. And it's a slow process and it's hard. I don't, I don't have an easy answer because you're, you're swimming completely upstream, but we can see from an evolutionary perspective, we can see the remnants, you know, you you know what the monkey sphere is, right? No. Um, It's called, it's also called the Dunbar number, which is there's a, there's a number of people that you can keep track of. And it centers around about 150 up to 300 people. The Dunbar number is basically the number of relationships, individual relationships that that any human being can manage. In reality, you can learn the names of more than 150 or 300 people, but you can't have any significant relationship with them. Um, And this has been this has been observed in um, in our primate relatives, too. So that's why it's called the monkey sphere, that they they will organize themselves around this sort of number of about 150 or, or so maximum in a troop. And when the troop exceeds that Dunbar number, they'll split into a second troop. So so naturally, they will they will put themselves in lower numbers. There is a psychological phenomenon I've pointed out a couple times recently that your cortisol or your stress hormone levels um, elevate anytime you encounter a stranger. And then you, if you sit and say, wait a minute, John, I see strangers every day, all day long. I see more strangers than people I know. And the answer is, I know. And it's spiking your cortisol levels all day long, every day. You're in constant stress and, and you feel like you're in constant danger, which is why Americans keep buying guns. They're trying to, they're trying to, they feel a sense of danger, a sense of threat from people around them. So they buy a gun to, in order to quell that th- sense of threat. But now there's another gun in the mix, right? So they don't necessarily feel safer. So they buy another gun, another gun, another gun. And you see sometimes these people and they have pictures. They're bragging on Facebook, but they'll, they'll put down there. There's like a five-year-old holding a machine gun and a seven-year-old holding a machine gun. And in front of them, you know, are just like multiple handguns. And, 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 and like there'll be 40 guns for four people. Well, there's a, there's a false sense of security going on here because we only have two hands. 
you know, um, and and there's only so much you can do with that. But what should be clear from that photograph, and I'm not making a comment on her guns, good or bad. I'm trying to make a comment on the fact that the gun does not satisfy the individual buying them because they keep buying them. If 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 owning a gun made them feel more safe, then Americans would feel like the safest people on the planet. But they don't. And this goes into this this bigger thing. We have to start deconstructing so much of what we have around us, and we have to start building communities, close communities of people who are who you can actually see and smell and get annoyed by. And get annoyed by. So I think the real question is, how do we build a community like our ancestors did without turning it into a cult? Oh, that is the big question. There is actually... <laughs> A lot of work that's being done on this front. Um, I would refer anybody who's interested in this topic to IC.org. Let me make sure that's the right place. Okay, so IC stands for Intentional Community. And you have um, sort of the back to the earth movement in the United States in the 60s and 70s where a lot of these um, hippie communes kind of came into light. And they were an absolute rejection of, you know, American commercialism. And oftentimes, you know, free love, free drugs, free, free everything. And most of them proved to be unstable. Not all of them. Some of them are still around and have been operating, you know, for a, a long time. Um, the famous case in um, Denmark of Christiana, um, I think that's how it's pronounced. There's an old military base in the middle of Copenhagen. I might be getting some of the facts wrong here. But it was taken over by a bunch of hippies like 50 years ago. And they've had a continual community there. But they've done they've had to deal with drug problems and prostitution problems and stuff like that. But so there are people who are trying to figure out how to make us live together um, and and not fall into the same hierarchies, which can then be exploited and turned into cults. And IC.org, Intentional Community, is the clearinghouse for all these organizations that are doing this. And they have um, they have some. um methods they have created and have been written about that allow for um, consensus. The, the one is called consensus, and uh, they're also called radical democracy. Um, there are several different movements in here, but they, they give a framework for um, discussing things with people and to arrive at consensus opinions where everybody has a voice. It is slow and it is inefficient but it is very solid. When they arrive at decisions, they tend to be they tend to be good ones. Now, there's a there's a thumb on the scale for these organizations. Almost everything they want to do to move away from our consumer driven, individualistic, separated, religious driven world, um, the the whole, the whole system is kind of set up to not have you do that. So a lot of these things become um, you know illegal. Kind of like if you live in the suburbs, you know, it might be zoned for single family housing. Even though we live in homes that are big enough to, to easily accommodate two or three families, that's just a preference that we've imposed on the world, right? So um, I don't think we have to give up hope. There's others who are working on these problems, and there's been a lot of in innovations, but it's going to take hard work. We can't be lazy. We, we changed so much during the Industrial Revolution, during the, since, since, let's say, the Enlightenment, that we need to take breath sometimes look back and say, this didn't work out so well for us, or this was good. Why don't we go back to that? So my view is that we take future innovation and technology and things of the past that we might have discarded that were actually very healthy and very good for us, and we create new cultural movements based on that. I That's, that's my idea for moving forward. I think that's a great plan. And I, I give up on reforming from the top down. You have to build it from the bottom up. You have to build your Dunbar group. You have to build your monkey sphere. And sometimes that means you need to start meeting your neighbors and having barbecues and do and doing some of those things that we know we want, but we've been conditioned that in the moment we don't, you know, we just want to stay home because it's easier. And I think we have to overcome some of those, those tendencies. I think I'm going to try a little bit more of that cultivating more relationships or strengthening the ones that I have. And yeah, I think that's a, a great way to live. You're going to try and you're going to fail a lot. You're going to fail more than you're going to succeed because the, the deck is stacked against you. I only say that because I want people to understand that it's not easy to do. It's, it's like finding somebody to marry that you really want to join your life with. It's not easy to do. 
But for many of us, it is more than worth it. it is so it's a most wonderful part of life. But it takes work, and it's it's the same thing here. And it also means that you have to stop. I think this one's important. You have to stop measuring and evaluating yourself by the quality of friends you have. This is something we very much do in this culture. We want friends that reflect who we envision we are. So we want friends who are either in our socioeconomic class or above. We want friends who dress the way we do. We want friends who share the same um, values that we do. And some of those values are immutable. They have, you have to share them or you won't. But you don't only have to have friends with people that are in your socioeconomic class, but you might have to step down. You might have to not have steak for your neighborhood get-togethers. You might need to have hot dogs, but that's okay. We used to do that all the time. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your perspectives, and I have loved this conversation. I do have the Linda Listen segment. So okay. this is a statement, a statement that you would like to say to an organization or anyone who has pissed you off or put you down and just give them the words that you haven't been able to say or words that you have said, but you just really want to drill in. Who do I feel unappreciated by? That's what you're at. Who do I, who do I want to give, give the, the <laughs> truth to? Um, or it could be, it could, it doesn't have to be a specific person. So I think an example would be, Linda, listen, I don't need faith in your specific God to be an amazing person and someone who is reducing harm in this world. Okay. I, I, I think if the, the, I could have a really brash, um, bombastic in your face personality online. And this isn't really about me, but oftentimes when we're fighting out things like politics and religion, which are both extremely important to who we are, you know, the old adage is polite people don't talk about sex, politics or religion, but sex, politics and religion are really core to everything that's happening to us. I, I, I would hope that people can see beyond those things and try to find common ground um underneath them and this this goes this goes for me too i have good friends who don't i don't see eye to eye with at all i have people who i'd count as good friends who are evangelicals who are maga as maga as they come but we just connect on other basis and the basis we connect on is our humanity so i guess my plea for all of everybody is we need a little bit more empathy for for everyone um and including people who are jerks and people who are mean and people who are i i, I it's it's we have to recognize that the darkness we see in others around us exists in us too and that means the people like Jeffrey Holland and the Quorum of the Twelve, they need to recognize that they that they themselves are flawed and have caused a lot of pain. Um, I have no doubt that I've recorded things out there that have caused people distress and pain, but I balance it by the fact that there are so many others, and my intention is for those who it helps heal and helps them move beyond. So my Linda Listen segment is for all of us to say we have to become more empathetic to everyone around us. And then as the great St. Taylor Swift says, we all need to calm down. <laughs> that includes I me. love it. I love the positive spin on the Linda Listen. I appreciate that. So, John, you are in multiple places, but tell people how they can find you, how they can listen to more of your content and how they can support you. Sure. Uh, if you're interested in Mormonism and deconstructing it, the old Mormon expression podcast is still available on, you know, like iTunes and and um, Spotify and places that have that. You just look for Mormon expression uh, generously hosted by Mormon stories. Um, um, they're the ones who um, have that posted up there. Um, the Mormon stories podcast. I have a monthly segment where I appear on and um, and talk about some aspect of the doctrine. Um, I have a website that I don't keep up very much at John Larson, L-A-R-S-E-N dot org. You can go see. And right now I'm I've recorded some videos on YouTube. My intent is to um, put them um, 
is to do more of the work that I need to do and start posting the the podcast stuff. So usually if you search John Larson Mormon on Google, you'll find all sorts of um, stuff that, that I've got my fingers in. But those are the places I, I can be found. Um, if you're if if you really want um, me to interact with you, get really excited. Religion is important, but it doesn't get me as excited uh, as things like how we um, produce more vegetables in a small area, how we can um, make ourselves more resilient against you know corporations and pending climate change, and how we take those things that I'm talking about to make a resilient society that can move into the next phase of humanity. I think we're coming to the close of an era of a, uh, and that era is. Oh, you were just asking me for stuff, and I'm 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 giving you a whole big speech, but I love we're, it. We're coming close to the end of an era, which is go 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 burn 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 use up, and I don't know if we're ten years away or three hundred years away from you know the end of oil and the end of some of these things, but we're gonna get there, and we have to learn to live in in new ways. So if if that. In, in, if that um, excites you, then reach out to me. My email is john at johnlarson.org. Thank you. That's great. I, I'm i going to need to get some gardening tips on how to <laughs> grow a lot of small vegetables in my backyard. So <laughs> we'll be well, in touch. It's, it's fun. <laughs> and it's, it's it's nice to, it's something, you know, so much we feel so helpless. So we feel so helpless about what's happening. These things are macro things going on that have complex multi-century causes and most and it's easy just to feel like you want to give up and but we have to hold on to hope i mean this is to carry around to what you were talking about in the beginning we have to have have hope and we have to have resilience i look at i try to pattern my life really a lot of ways after my grandparents who lived through world war one and world war two and the depression and they never had a lot of money but they lived a really richly exuberant life they ate really great food and and there were always, you know, big celebrations and festivals and that sort of stuff. What we've we've lost in in a generation the best part of what made us human, and and I think we can get it back. So, um, I I think there there is hope because we're not that far from removed from the solution. I agree, I agree. Well, thank you so much for your time, John. It's been an amazing conversation. I can't wait to have everyone else listen to it as well. And any final thoughts before we go? No, it's been my pleasure. Thanks again for for the chance, and um, and thanks for asking the, the the right questions. I'm glad that there's more people approaching this from different ways. You know, we've had enough of old white guys telling us what to believe. You know. <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And to everyone listening, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at cults to consciousness or reach out by email at cults to consciousness at gmail.com.